start and we'll try to keep the second half of the table shorter just because the we're running out of battery storage on the uh, video machine. But uh, so go to your second worksheet there. So I think you know we'll go through all of these things, but we already listed out the six apostles to the right of our Lord. And then we'll talk about uh, who was the first disciple to be martyred. You know, why does Leonardo depict St. Thomas with his finger extended? Uh, at the Last Supper, Philip asks, Master, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. What was our Lord's response? And Matthew is uh, clean-shaven as well as St. John. He's just gesturing with both hands. We'll talk about why that is. And uh, St. Jude pointing to his chest. And then number seven, uh, you know, which disciples were here have journeyed the farthest and met his fate? by being uh, martyred, by being sawed in half. Okay, so there we are, and we'll keep the, uh, uh, just going through uh, left to right, so that's how we read, that's how we'll learn the names of the apostles then. So the first head is uh, St. Thomas, and he has his uh, index finger that is gesturing towards the Christ, and so, you know, everybody remembers that uh, St. Thomas is the one after the resurrection that uh, he wasn't with the uh, the faithful eleven, uh, uh, that the ten were by themselves, and the Lord appeared to them, and Thomas was off by himself, and then he comes back and they say, we've seen the Lord. And he's like, no, I'm, I won't believe unless I take, uh, probe the wounds with my finger, put my finger into the nail marks in his hands, take my hand and place it into his side, the wounded side of Christ, that fifth wound, two hand wounds, two feet wounds, the fifth wound being the wound in the side from the spear of Longinus then. And so the Downing Thomas always get that bad rap, and uh, Caravaggio's got the beautiful painting of uh, the Christ directing the finger of uh, Saint uh, Thomas to the, uh, his wounded side, and Peter and John are looking over his shoulder in amazement. Uh, but there's uh, Saint Thomas prefigured. There's the finger uh, that he's gesturing towards the Christ. So it's the foreshadowing that he's going to say, you know, unless I take my finger and probe the hand in the nail marks, I won't believe that Jesus has risen from the dead. You know, who, who could raise from the dead? That's an impossibility. You remember what Jesus says, don't tell, after the transfiguration, don't tell what you've seen until after I've been raised from the dead. The, the apostles come down the mountain stretching their head. What does that mean, be raised from the dead? It's, it's impossible, right? So, uh, there's the finger of St. Thomas. And you go to Rome, uh, the, the reliquary and the uh, Holy Church, Santa Croce, Santa Croce, uh, uh, the St. Helena's Church, right across the street from the Labyrinth. Uh, they have a reliquary, and it's in the shape of a hand and a finger, and it's the, the finger bones of St. Thomas. One of the coolest relics you'll ever see in Rome is to actually have the finger, the bones, uh, in the hand of St. Thomas. And then that's at Santa Croce in, uh, in Rome, Church of the Holy Cross. Okay, so that's Thomas. And then uh, he's got not, he's like Peter, huh? He was sitting in one position, maybe he was between James and Philip, but he's, uh, his head stuck on the other side of John. Uh, St. Thomas' head is stuck on the other side of James and between James and you know, our Lord then, okay? And then that next head, very close, is St. James, and you see he's got uh, both of his hands spread out as a sign of uh, martyrdom, and he's going to give up his uh, life for the Lord. Uh, St. James is the first apostle to be martyred. And uh, I think he's beheaded by Herod, remember? Remember Herod found out what a delight it was to the people that he had beheaded uh, James, and so he's after Peter then. And so he has Peter in prison before Peter escapes with the help of the angels. But, uh, you know, just that image that your hands are outstretched. You know, if, if you're a prize fighter and you're in the boxing ring, you know, would Muhammad Ali do that when he was taunting his, his opponents that, you know, he'd be like, he'd put his hands down and beg him to take a shot at him. You know, he'd already beat him to a pulp. He knew that he wasn't risking anything, that they couldn't uh, make a good shot at him. But, you know, if a prize fighter puts his hands down, you just pummel him to death and win the battle easy. You know, that's what St. James is. I'll give up, I will give up my life for the Lord. I won't even defend myself. That's what a martyr does. That, uh, my faith is even more precious to me than my life. I lay it down for my Lord. And so that's James. He's actually protecting our Lord from Thomas and Philip. So Thomas and Philip both got up from their spot at the table, and they're you know, asking Jesus vehemently who it is that's going to betray him. And you know, 
James is already doing some protecting of his own by stretching out his arms like that. A sign of martyrdom. But you can see the full chest of James. Remember of James the Lesser? You barely see anything of his chest. But uh, James the Greater, uh, in the green robes, you really uh, see all of his chest. And I think there's a glare from the, from the lights. But You see his whole chest exposed there. So James is the first uh, apostle to die. It's a martyr. And then Philip is the next one. St. Philip. Kind of got the uh, orangish robes there. Uh, St. Philip. So, St. Philip is the one, if you uh, go to uh, John chapter 14, verse 8. So right in John's Gospel, chapter 14, Philip says, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Remember that? So he asked the question at the Last Supper. And Jesus' reply is, Philip, have you been with me so long you do not recognize me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Okay. So now we have to go a little bit into the, the image of the picture. Uh, uh, just a little side note, and it hasn't been substantiated by anything, but... Uh, uh, Philip doesn't have a beard either. So remember, see, John is the only one without a beard or facial hair on the left side of the painting. And then there's two men on the right side that don't have uh, hair, facial hair. And one of them is Philip. And uh, uh, there's a tradition that uh, Philip was the favorite apostle of uh, Leonardo da Vinci. That this might be a self-portrait of Leonardo himself at an earlier age. So we always have those pictures of Leonardo. You know, he's got that really long white beard and the mustache. Have you seen those pictures of Leonardo da Vinci? That says an older man. Uh, this, uh, the tradition is that uh, Leonardo, well, the artists did this a lot, but they would put themselves into the image. And so he gave his face to St. Philip. And so this is the young Leonardo, what he would look like. So that's the reason that... Uh, uh, Philip doesn't have a beard. It's just the young Leonardo depicted at that, at that picture. But all the rest of the apostles don't have beards for a reason. Okay, except for St. John. But uh, remember this, uh, this painting? Uh, it's called a one-point perspective, or it has a vanishing point. And the vanishing point is above Christ's head. And so you can see how the walls of the room are slanted back. If you look at, uh, I think in our own times, you have those images of a railroad track where a person's standing on a railroad and the, the tracks are to his left and to his right and then the railroad goes off into the distance, right? And it goes to the vanishing point. And that gives perspective to the painting then. So it gives it depth or three-dimensionality. And so that's what this picture is. Leonardo painting on a flat wall. It's, just, it's like this wall over here, 15 feet tall, 29 feet across. Leonardo is putting depth and three-dimensionality into the painting. He's able to do that so that you can see that, that Peter's elbow is coming out at an angle with the knife in it. And uh, that Philip has gotten up and he's pointing to his chest and he's asking that question, you know, uh, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. This, uh, it isn't a one-point perspective, but the cool thing about this painting, and it's nice that you can do it with your holy cards that I gave you, that... Uh, you can bend the card, and you can make it into a circle. See that? Just like that. Um, when I went to Milan with my folks, uh, that was the reason we went. We went from Venice by train to Milan. One of the Eurostar trains just took a couple of hours uh, to go across Italy, to Venice in the far west, and Milan uh, more central underneath the Dolomites uh, of uh, Switzerland. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm practicing on the train. I can still remember this. You know, my Italian wasn't that great. I was struggling with English. And then I'm having to learn this foreign language. But um, I'm wondering you know, how I'm going to find uh, the Last Supper in Milan, this giant city like the size of Chicago. How am I going to find this Last Supper painting and everything? So I rehearsed that. I would say, Dove la ultima cena. I say, where is the Last Supper? As soon as I get off the train, I'm going to start asking people. So yeah, I get off the train. You know how people are in a train station. They don't have the time of day for nothing. It's supposed to be all these businessmen are in a hurry. They don't have time to stop and give directions to a tourist. So I'm always asking, Dove la ultima cena to all these 
town leads, and they're just running past me, like, get out of here, kid. And uh, nobody's answering my question. Finally, uh, there's an elderly gentleman, uh, hat, uh, suit, and everything, uh, walking slow, and I, I hit this guy. And I ask him, do me the ultimate gene? He goes, Padre. He says, Father, no dicere the ultimate gene. He says, don't say the Last Supper. Ma vole il cercolo. He says, call it, don't call it the Last Supper. Call it il cercolo. And I'm like, I don't know what that even means. It's like, uh, I, the word for dinner is cena in Italian. I thought maybe it has something to do with supper. But il cercolo is uh, a circle. And so the Middle East people, where there are people from Milan that see this, uh, they're famous for housing the last uh, supper image of Leonardo da Vinci, uh, known the world over. They call it not the last supper, but they call it the, the circle, the last time that Jesus circled the apostles around him and celebrated the Eucharist. And so if you look at your, the painting, Bartholomew looks bigger and so does St. Matthew, or St. Simon on the far side. These figures on the ends of the table look bigger than the, pic than the pictures in the middle. So John, Peter, Judas are definitely smaller than Andrew, James, and Bartholomew. Can you see that? And what's going on is it's got this perspective that, and it's the coolest thing, you have to actually go to Milan to see this, if you sit at one spot in the dining room and you look at the Last Supper painting, if you sit at a very specific spot, it looks like the painting curves around you, just like you would take this holy card and bend it around. So if you were the camera, uh, the, the, the painting would fold around you, and Bartholomew would be on your left, and St. Simon the Zealot would be on your right, and that's why they're bigger. They're painted in bigger perspective because they're standing closer to you. And Jesus and the other disciples, they're at the far end of the table, a circular table though, not a flat table out like this. So remember all those other artists painting apostles on both sides of the table? Leonardo painting them all on the same side of the table? Leonardo's table is actually a circle. And the apostles are circled around the Christ. But only the Milanese people know this because they go to see the painting all the time. They call it Il Cercolo, the time that Jesus Christ circled the apostles around him to celebrate the Last Supper, the intimacy of our Lord in that meal. And the reason I go over this with the Apostle Philip is you look at Jesus, the figure of our Lord in the Last Supper, and he's a triangle shape. See that? It's almost like his head is the top of the triangle, and then his arms come out, and they're the... Uh,
what's the shape that I see there? It's another triangle, only it's upside down. So it's the, the apex of the triangle is at the table, whereas the triangle the apex is the head of Christ over here. It's an upside down triangle right next to Jesus of Nazareth. The triangle is a symbol of the Trinity. When you're doing shorthand, uh, I could teach you religious shorthand when you're trying to write down everything that the professor is saying. He's talking so fast, especially in Italian. You've got to know some kind of shorthand to keep your notes up. Uh, you, he talks about Jesus. Just write a triangle. That's Jesus. If you write an upside down triangle, that's shorthand for God the Father. Now, Philip asks the question, Jesus, show us the Father, we'll believe you're the Son. Jesus, I've shown you the Father. Every time you looked at me, you've seen the Father. The Father and I are one. Here I am, this triangle upright. Here's my Father, right next to me. The members of the Trinity can't be separated from each other. Like a man and his wife, they're always together. The two become one. The Trinity, the three persons are always one, God. It's not, there's a God called the Father, a God called the Son, a God called the Holy Spirit. No, it's one God and three persons. Son, Philip, look at your vantage point from the table. Remember, the table's circular. Philip stands up. He can see the triangle of Christ's position. He can see the inverted triangle of the Father. Leonardo da Vinci is answering the question when Jesus gives the reply, Philip, have you been with me so long and you don't recognize me? Whoever seen me has seen the Father. Instead of putting a bubble that says that, he puts these two triangles right next to each other. I told you, the painting is talking to us. It's a, it's a masterpiece of theology. I would say it's perfect theology. It's not like artists nowadays. Oh, I'm depressed, I'm moody. So I'm going to paint more blue over here and black and dark colors. You know? Or this abstract thing, you know, you're some uh, uh, Picasso-type guy. And you make something and you put it in the center of Chicago City and nobody knows what the heck it is. You know? What is that? It's, it's, it's Picasso after a, a, a chili enchilada supper and it backed up on him. And that was the vision he had in one of his nightmares after a bad meal. You know? This, that's artists today. Catholic artists, artists that live their faith in the media that they worked in, that's Leonardo da Vinci. It's perfect theology. It's based on the scriptures. It's based on tradition. Right? And that's why 500 years later, we're in a town called Sublette, Illinois, and we're talking about this piece of religious art. I guarantee you, 500 years from now, Nobody's going to be talking about the Picasso in Chicago's Daily Center Square. It has nothing to do with God. It has no theological significance to the spirituality of the human soul. But this does. 500 years from now, people will still be talking about this painting. Because it's Catholic. The church transcends time. Nothing else does. See that? Perfect theology here. Leonardo answers the question, and you don't even have to have the scriptures in front of you. You see Jesus, you see the Father. They're one. Okay. Our last group of three, we said Matthew, Jude, Simon. So, uh, put your worksheet there. Matthew's clean shaven and gesturing to the Christ with both hands. What was Da Vinci trying to tell us about this apostle by his depiction? Uh, Matthew, uh, he was, another name for Matthew is Levi, so he's also known as Levi, so Matthew's gospel doesn't talk about Matthew, it says Levi was at his customs post, and Jesus comes in and says, follow me, and he got up and left. It's just uh, two verses in sacred scripture about the vocational call of Matthew. But remember, if, uh, if you worked for the Roman government, so that's what the tax collectors did, they worked for Caesar, and they collected taxes from the people in the district where they were, and they gave that money back to uh, Julius Caesar to support his armies to conquer the world. Uh, if you worked for the Roman government, you had to shave. So that was the dress policy. Not you have to wear a tie and a suit, you have to shave. 
So the Roman soldiers, they were the only soldiers in the world that shaved. The barbarians, they got these big hairy beards. They go to battle the Romans, and the Romans are fighting. A Roman loses his shield, and another Roman soldier comes up and is about to knock his head off because you're in the fray of the, the heat of the battle. Uh, he says, oh, you don't have a beard. You're on my side. I'm only going to strike down people with beards. I'm only going to fight the barbarians. So that's why Caesar had all of the soldiers shave so that if you were in battle, you knew who was on your side and who was on the opposite side. You know, you ask military men, uh, you know, today, the men hate to shave. You know, it's just, oh, i got to shave today. i got to do this, i got to do that, i got to shave again. You know, uh, especially people that are in the military, barbarians, they, would hate, they wouldn't shave before going into battle, but the Romans would. So here's Matthew, a Jew, Levi, but he shaved. The beard, facial hair, a sign of wisdom in the Jewish culture, no right man in his right mind would shave. But because Matthew works for Caesar, he has to. So why did St. John not have a beard? He's too young, he can't grow one. Why does St. Philip not have a beard? That's Leonardo depicting himself. It's a self-portrait of a young Leonardo. Is his favorite apostle? Don't you have your favorite apostle? Huh? We should all... Uh, one of the twelve should be on our dream team. Now that should be one of your favorite uh, saints of all time should be one of the twelve. You have to have a virgin martyr on your dream team. You have to have one of the twelve. That's the rules. It just has to be. So Leonardo's favorite apostle was Philip. Paints himself there. That's the reason Philip didn't have a beard. That's the reason Matthew doesn't have one. It is a tradition that Matthew was ambidextrous, so he could read and he could write with both hands. So remember Matthew's the gospel writer? Uh, he's pointing back to Christ with both hands. He's going to write this beautiful gospel on the life of Jesus, and both hands are pointing, gesticulating back to the Christ. So it's easy to tell. Who's that? It's Matthew. He's clear.